May God bless you all. In today's sharing concerning the topic we are dealing with, that is, Slavorum Apostoli, or rather the 11th centenary of the evangelization work of St. Cyril and St. Methodius, we'll be seeing that for the purpose of evangelization, the two holy brothers, as their biographies indicate, undertook the difficult task of translating the text of the sacred scriptures, which they knew into, in Greek, into the language of the Slav population, which has settled along the borders of their own region and native city. Making use of their own Greek language and culture for this arduous and unusual enterprise, they set themselves to understanding and penetrating the language customs and traditions of the Slav peoples, faithfully interpreting the aspirations and human values which were present and expressed therein. In order to translate the truths of the Gospel into a new language, they had to make an effort to gain a good grasp of the interior world of those to whom they intended to proclaim, the word of God in images and concepts that would um, sound familiar to them. They realized that an essential condition of the success of their missionary activity was to transpose correctly biblical notions and Greek theological concepts into a very different context of thought and historical experience. It was a question of a new method of catechesis. To defend its legitimacy and prove its value, St. Methodius, at first with his brother and then alone, did not hesitate to answer with docility the invitations to come to Rome, invitations received first from Pope Nicholas I in 867 and from Pope John VIII in 879. Both popes wished to compare the doctrine being taught by the brothers in Greater Moravia with that which the apostles Peter and Paul had passed down together with the glorious trophy of their holy relics to the church's chief episcopal see. Previously, Constantine and his follow, fellow workers had been engaged in creating a new alphabet so that the truths to be proclaimed and explained could be written in Old Slavonic and would thus be fully comprehended and grasped by the hearers. The effort to learn the language and to understand the mentality of the new peoples to whom they wished to bring the faith was truly worthy of the missionary spirit. Exemplary too was their determination to assimilate and identify themselves with all the needs and expectations of the Slav peoples. Their generous decision to identify themselves with those peoples' life and traditions once having purified and enlightened them by revelation, make Cyril and Methodius true models for all the missionaries who in every period have accepted St. Paul's invitation to become all things to all people in order to redeem all, and in particular for the missionaries who, from ancient times until the present day, from Europe to Asia and today in every continent, have labored to translate the Bible and the text of the liturgy into the living languages of the various peoples, so as to bring them the one word of God, thus made accessible in each civilization's own forms of expression. Perfect communion and love preserves the Church from all forms of particularism, ethnic exclusivism or racial prejudice, and from any nationalistic arrogance. This communion must elevate and sublimate every purely natural legitimate sentiment of the human heart. Now we can see in the lives of Cyril and Methodius that they planted the Church of God. In fact the characteristics of the approach adopted by the apostles of the Slavs, Cyril and Methodius, which we have already emphasized in this in, is this peaceful way in which they built up the church guided as they were by their vision of the church as one holy and universal 
Even those love Christians more than others tend to think of the Holy Brothers as Slavs at heart. The latter nevertheless remain men of Hellenic culture and Byzantine training. In other words, men who fully belong to the civil and ecclesiastical tradition of the Christian East. Already in their time, certain differences between Constantinople and Rome had begun to appear as pretexts for disunity, even though the deplorable split between the two parts of the same Christian world was still in the distant future. The evangelizers and teachers of the Slavs set out for Greater Moravia, imbued with all the wealth of tradition and religious experience which marked Eastern Christianity and which was particularly evident in theological teaching and in the celebration of the sacred liturgy. The sacred rites in all the churches within the borders of the Byzantine Empire had long been celebrated in Greek. However, the traditions of many national churches of the East, such as the Gregorian and the, such as the Georgian and the Syriac, which use the language of the people in their liturgies, were well known to the advanced cultural milieu of Constantinople. They were especially well known to Constantine the philosopher, as a result of his studies and of his many contacts with Christians belonging to those churches, both in the capital and in the course of his journeys. Both the brothers were aware of the antiquity and legitimacy of these traditions and were therefore not afraid to use the Slavonic language in the liturgy and lo, make it into an effective instrument for bringing the divine truths to those who spoke it. This they did without any spirit of superiority or domination, but out of love, of justice and with a clear apostolic zeal for peoples then developing. Father God, in Jesus' name, Jesus' blood, and the Holy Spirit, we thank you for St. Cyril and St. Methodius. And we ask you that you grant us as a church to learn that unity in your church is found in diversity, in a diversity that explains and expounds more the notion and the reality of your love, which is agape. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' blood, and the Holy Spirit, we pray and we also pray for the unity between the Catholic and the Orthodox churches so that your church will be one. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And may God Almighty bless you and protect you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.